Uh, so today we'll hold a one hour presentation on uncertainty quantification in machine learnings. So in particular, I will uh, present some work done on federated conformal prediction. So first of all, let's explain the federated learning setting and why it's uh, needed in today's machine learning area. So nowadays you have a lot of local users that own uh, local data and you want to make them collaborate to benefit from all these local data to learn better models. Uh, it could have great application, for example, in autonomous driving cars, where you have a lot of individual vehicles. And it could have also application in healthcare, because doctors want to have reliable predictions. And so you should use as many sources of data as possible. More specifically, in the federated learning setting, you have several clients. And in the centralized uh, federated setting, you also have a central server. And the local client do compu computation locally to train, for example, a parametric model. And then, time to time, they will send information to the central server. And the central server will aggregate all the received information from the local client and will send back some information to the local client. So, for example, it can be parameter or it can be gradient. And uh, you need also to respect some constraints. So there is a privacy constraint. For example, if you are running an hospital, you cannot transfer the data from patients to the hospital. Uh, there is also some heterogeneity issue. As uh, you have local data, the distribution can be different. Uh, there is one example is, for example, if you are training uh, object detection models and also bird detection models. If you are in Africa or in Northern Europe, you want to observe the same birds. And there is a scalability constraint. As you have a lot of data, you should have uh, efficient algorithms. And also communication uh, constraint. As it involves many iteration between client and server, uh, then you should maybe compress the information or to, to communicate less, but uh, better information. And it is in this setting that today we will discuss about uncertainty management. Uh, if you have a parametric model, for example, then uh, your prediction can be very sensitive sometimes to the choice of parameter. And it's why you want uh, to be confident about your prediction, especially in some fields where uh, it's uh, really important, for example, in uh, medicine. And it's uh, what will motivate our talk today. Uh, so it will be oriented uh, by two central questions. Uh, in the first part, we will uh, try to answer how to generate confidence interval while respecting all the constraints of federated learning. So the purpose is um, to create a confidence uh, is not an interval generally, but a confidence set, uh, C alpha, that is likely to contain the true output Y, given an input X. So for example, X can be an image, one Y can be this, uh, its associated label, and the user will fix a confidence level one minus alpha. So it is an average condition. And the second question will be, uh, can we go further? and also ensure some, um, some um, uh, quality uh, given some data set, because in reality, you have a fixed uh, calibration data set, and then you construct your prediction set on it. And um, so we would um, dig into this question. So uh, it will be uh, divided in two parts. In the first one, we will introduce uh, the basic uh, concepts of federated conformal prediction. And then we will go further with this uh, conditional uh, coverage. So we will start uh, part one with this ni nice picture. So it's a doctor that is uh, uh, saying to his patient that the operation has a success uh, probability of 95%. And the patient is asking, but what about the remaining 5%? So it's exactly what a conformal prediction will give you. It will create a prediction set at a certain level of confidence, but you have no more information than that. And uh, let's start by uh, seeing how it works. So first, you have some, you need some data. So XK, uh, as we mentioned, can be an image, and YK can be uh, the 
label and the user set first the miscoverage rate, so alpha, and the purpose is for new data to obtain a prediction set C alpha of X such that the true output will belong to this prediction set and we call this probability the coverage and the purpose is really to target the level y minus alpha so classically alpha can be taken as 0 0.1 then you obtain a 90% coverage and that also some practical constraints uh, because for example you want if the image is really easy and clear you want the prediction set to be very small so here we can see that it's a fox squirrel so we have just one label and if the image is more difficult to labelize then you want to include more uh, possibilities in your prediction set and here is the case because it's a little bit uh, dark uh, so why should we use conformal prediction? So first it's very easy to understand, it's also easy to implement, so there are no uh, really difficult uh, underlying concepts. And also it can work under little assumption, so there is no assumption on uh, the data distribution and so on. And also it can be uh, post-processing, so if you have a neural network, then you can take it and create your prediction set from that. So it's uh, very flexible and it is for all these reasons that it has become more popular these uh, last years. So here's just a number of citations from a famous book on conformal prediction and we can see that from 2018 there are more uh, people involved in uh, the conformal community. And uh, I will explain to this the really the simplest way to create prediction sets. So it's called the split conformal method and uh, you start from your data. Uh, we will first assume that there are IID but in fact it's not uh, necessary. And then you create, you take a, a conformity score function, so V, and the conformity score function will map your data into the real line. And so the easiest way to create the prediction set uh, given an input X is to take every label Y such that the score of the data uh, x, y is below the quantile of mu bar and mu bar is here the distribution of your scores and by doing that we know that uh, we will have some good coverage because the probability will be bounded between 1 minus alpha and 1 minus alpha plus an epsilon term that will tend to zero with a lot of data I simplified a little bit here because in fact we know exactly the, the, this probability. I just replaced by a simpler bound. And uh, just a point, the uh, upper bound is only valid if you have almost surely distinct uh, conformity scores. Otherwise there is just uh, the lower bound and uh, you need a little bit more to have the upper bound also. Uh, so it works more generally even if you have some exchangeability of data. So exchangeability is a little bit uh, weaker because it means that the joint distribution of your data will be the same up to any permutation. And uh, the proof of uh, the, the, good, uh, the quality of the coverage is uh, quite uh, quick. Uh, you have that the probability that the label belongs to the prediction set is equal to the expectation of the indicator and you can rewrite it by definition of your prediction set such that uh, it's the expectation of the indicator that the conformity score is uh, below the quantile and um, as every data is exchangeable you can uh, rewrite it as a sum so it's more a combinatorial uh, result than a probabilistic one and then in fact you know exactly the um, this quantity and you know that it's uh, it belongs to these intervals um, and so as we mentioned a prediction um, conformal prediction is a parametric uh, setting and uh, the split conformal prediction is uh, a sub field inside conformal prediction it's the easiest to get so it's why I will present it uh, today so you start from a data set and you split it into a training and a calibration data set. We will denote D the calibration data set. 
And then you learn a score function, uh, also called the conformity score function V, on the training data set. And you use the calibration data set to compute uh, your prediction set and to compute the quantile. And uh, it works if you have exchangeable data, but then it's much more difficult if it is not exchangeable. For example, if you have some heterogeneity between agents, that should be the case in a federated setting. Then, uh, in fact, you no longer have theoretical guarantee. And there is also some privacy constraint because, as we mentioned, uh, in federated learning, you want to ensure some privacy that uh, you will keep the data safe uh, from, uh, from um, the local agents. So, for all these reasons, we will try uh, in this first pass to to, to build an algorithm that will uh, respect uh, federated constraints. And we will consider a setting where we have little n uh, local agents. And uh, they also own some uh, local data set of size n i. And in fact, we want the local agents collaborate to build better prediction set, because if they act locally, they won't have a good uncertainty management. So you want to make them collaborate to benefit from everyone. And uh, one uh, central research question is how to, to personalize this prediction set. So we will now have an input from one specific agent, and we want to ensure that we will construct a prediction set that will be personalized for him. And also, uh, we want uh, to, to respect some uh, privacy constraint. And so we will assume some particular shift um, so we won't assume a global uh, uh, distribution shift heterogeneity between the agents. But in this first part, we will assume that we have a structured label shift. So it means that uh, for client I, uh, it will have a local distribution that will be different from others, but not so much because we will assume that it's uh, just the label uh, distribution that can change and not the distribution of the covariate given uh, the output, given y. And there is a big example to this setting, which comes from the pandemic outbreak. So in 2020, uh, where you, um, if you were coughing, people thought that maybe you had COVID. And uh, if you take a more rigorous uh, framework, x can be uh, some symptom. Wine can be the disease. And so during an epidemic, the probability will change. So you will experience some label shift, whereas the distribution of the symptom given your disease won't change. Um, so it is not because uh, you have a specific disease that the symptom will uh, evolve, will change um, during an epidemic. So to remedy to this problem, we, uh, we will uh, describe uh, our methods. So um, the first uh, observation was that you undercover if you use standard methods without uh, tackling the label shift. And so for that, uh, we decided to, to introduce some mixture distribution. So PICAL, PICAL as a P calibration. It's a mixture distribution because it's a ponderation. It's a weighted sum about uh, the local uh, distribution uh, PI. And the main, uh, one main idea was we maybe don't want to use every data from everyone, but in fact, we designed a subsampling algorithm, so it will be more clear with the next illustration. So in our algorithm, in fact, we don't use uh, the every data from every agent, but we subsample it. We don't take, for example, NI data from agent I, but we will take a lit little bit less. So it's based on the subsampling uh, mechanism. And in fact, the main idea was to, to, to build, to, to go to a simple case. Because if you do some uh, randomization, then in fact, you can expect that approximately, it is not true, but that uh, you will obtain uh, uh, some data sets that, that are almost IID. It is not exactly the case, but it was the ID. Uh, the idea, because first is not IID at all, we have some heterogeneity. And then if you subsample, uh, you are almost in a simple case where your subsample data are IID from a mixture calibration uh, distribution. 
And now we still have the local data for which we want to, to create the production set. Uh, this data come from agent G. But this problem is much more simple if you assume that everything, uh, the calibration data have the same uh, data distribution. And uh, this problem was uh, studied in, uh, by Tip Shirani in 2019. And it's an easier problem than the first one. And um, we use uh, similar techniques. So it's based on uh, some estimation of uh, density ratios. Uh, density ratios are easier to estimate than just the ratios because you have some errors that can uh, compensate uh, for practical applications. Uh, we autonormalize uh, these weights. So P is uh, an optimization of the distribution uh, uh, of the ratio uh, estimates. And now we will consider this production set. So with a little bit uh, a new distribution for the uh, weighted, uh, uh, the, distribu the weighted distribution of the conformity score function will be a little bit different because now we introduce uh, the autonormalized weight P. We also can see that we subsample the data and we decided to create this new production set. So it will be every label such that its score will be below uh, the weighted quantile. And uh, you can compare it to the standard method where you take every data and uniform weight. And um, we have uh, some theoretical warranty. So if you take um, a uh, the PI, which are the ponderation, the weight as the proportion of uh, data coming from agent one I compared to the overall uh, uh, calibration data size, then you can show that the probability that the uh, true observe the true output belong to the prediction set uh, personalized to agent G is very close to one minus alpha, which is your confidence level, because it's upper bounded by uh, a quantity that will tend to zero uh, if you have a lot of data. In fact, uh, the last term even vanishes if you have enough uh, local data on each agent. And so it's the, almost the classical weight because classically the bias is one over n and here is more log n divided by n. So we lost a factor log. Uh, so it was from um, some theory, but in fact, in practice, you don't have access to exact uh, likelihood ratio. So you need to estimate them. And actually the good point is that you can also modify uh, our theory and it will just add some total variation bound. So total variation is just uh, some uh, discrepancy between distribution. Uh, so it will work even with uh, some approximation in the ratio. And um, uh, also one good point is that uh, the likelihood ratio can be estimated on the train set. Uh, whereas in general in machine learning, you want to split a data set into a training, a calibration, and a test. Here, in fact, you can leverage twi twice the training set. So it's a, a good point because you have more data on the training data set. And we also have to, in our method, to determine a quantile. So it was a quantile of the weighted distribution. It's not um, easy to do it in practice. And so we use for that some federated learning algorithm, which are based on the loss function. So we want to minimize the loss function to find the, uh, the best, uh, uh, the best, um, the, the, the best predictor the, um, as we consider a parametric family. So it's based on our loss on ping ball loss function. So it's a kind of absolute value where you put a different slope. So it can be one minus alpha and alpha. So it's very similar to absolute value. But in fact, uh, if you minimize the ping ball loss function, you will find the quantile. And we also, um, so, so, so it was our main idea. But we even regularize with some uh, more envelope uh, the distribution of the pinball loss function because you prefer to have smooth function in federated learning. Uh, to have some convergent guarantee, you need to smooth your function. So it was our crucial idea was to smooth with uh, uh, some uh, Moro Yoshida inf convolution. And then we look to the minimization of this pinball loss function. And we denoted uh, Q. Uh, gamma, one of its uh, uh, minimizer, 
And under simple condition, we can show that we have a unique minimizer and also that the minimizer is very close uh, up to gamma to the true quantile. So in fact, it is what we will do in practice. It, we will minimize this last function. And um, just to go through the numerical uh, illustrations, so the idea was to uh, study, so to, to personalize the prediction set for a particular agent G. And for that, we, we, we add a fixed calibration set and we look to the percentage of time that uh, the a test point belongs to the calibration data, uh, to the prediction set that we construct. Uh, we also consider a target confidence level at one minus alpha. At uh, one minus alpha equals to uh, ninety percent, and we display uh, some methods. So there is, for example, the local one, which is if a particular client wants uh, to create production set, but just using its uh, own data set, so it's in green. So if it does not communicate. Uh, with other clients, we can see that uh, we have a huge deviation, even if the bias is very small because it is one over its number of local data, but you have large deviation. And uh, we also compare to the global methods, so which is in uh, blue. So in blue, if is uh, the method where you use uh, the standard conformal prediction algorithm, but without any shift correction. And as you have shift uh, between your client, because in federated you have some heterogeneity between the data, uh, in fact, you will tend to undercover. So it's why you are not at uh, uh, the, the one minus alpha uh, coverage. And our method is in purple. So in fact, with our shift correction, we were able to construct prediction set that uh, contain almost 90% of the time the true output. Um, so we also add some uh, more challenging uh, vision tasks. So I don't know if you know about ImageNet, but ImageNet is a big uh, data set in vision where you have 1,000 uh, 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 possibilities to label an image. For example, it can be a cat, it can be a house, it can be a, a car or some, a truck. And so you want to find the true label for for that, it's a, a very huge data set. And so there were a lot of compu uh, um, challenges, computer science challenging on this uh, uh, data set a couple, may, uh, last decade. And so we took back this uh, data set and we use a pretrained model because um, we mentioned that uh, conformal prediction are post-processing, so you can leverage existing uh, model. And uh, we display here uh, the empirical coverage in function of the level of shift. And we can see that the local method, which is still in green, uh, has similar performance even under shift because it's normal, you just use your local data. So as shift is between the client, it doesn't change anything. But in, in blue, it's uh, the standard method if you don't uh, correct for shift. Then you can see that it will uh, deviate. The more you have shift, and the more the global method will undercover it, coverage, cover it, and uh, undercover, sorry. And in purple, it's our method, so it's more robust uh, than uh, competitors. So to conclude part one, uh, we developed a federated uh, conformal algorithm. Uh, we were able to, cor to correct uh, so the uh, label shift but it was based on some density ratio estimate, which is not great because it's difficult to estimate uh, density, even if, if this ratio is a little bit better. And uh, in practice, in fact, it was um, robust even under, with crude estimate of the density ratio, uh, our algorithm was performing uh, rather well. And so it's a good point. But after submitting the first paper, we, uh, we understood that our theory wasn't able to fully capture why uh, we got good numerical results. In fact, in the experimental part, we display the distribution of the uh, coverage condition on the calibration data set, um, whereas our theory was mainly focused on the bias. And so it wasn't capturing the fact that uh, we had little bit deviation of the conditional coverage because the bias is just an average is not uh, capturing the deviation. 
And so it's why uh, we study with other co-authors, so there are many of them, but we studied uh, some conditional coverage guarantee. So just a quick recap, so it is uh, our setting, we are still considering the split conformal prediction. So to, to recall, we have the calibration data set, which is still D with N uh, data point. Uh, then we construct the distribution of the conformity scores, so which is denoted new. And the prediction set is a reliable such that the score is below the quantile. And then we saw that we are, we are almost uh, one minus alpha percent of the time. We have the true output that belongs to our prediction set. And so in this part, we will uh, go further and we will study the uh, conditional uh, coverage. So here it's a miscoverage rate. So it's alpha of D and it's the percentage of time that your a uh, true output does not belong to the prediction set given a specific calibration data set. So it's a little bit more important to study this quantity because in reality, you have your data set and it's fixed for every experiment. You won't change your data set for uh, if you want to compute uh, a new prediction. And um, we also have that the miscoverage rate uh, has a bias which is uh, uh, very, uh, which is very small because uh, the miscoverage rate in expectation is very close to the targeted level alpha. And if you assume that you have some IID conformity scores, uh, then in fact you even know the distribution of your uh, miscoverage rate. It follows a beta distribution. And so it's a distribution that is concentrated around alpha and you, you have this uh, this equality, so you know that with a huge probability you will be very close to, to alpha. And you can compare also uh, these, uh, these with the bias, because in fact the bias will be in 1 over n, whereas the deviation will be a little bit uh, larger. So it is why I believe that we, we expect in our numerical part, we saw that we have more deviation than bias. And um, there is one theorem from Vogue, uh, which uh, dates from uh, 2012. So it shows that uh, the miscoverage rate is uh, very close to alpha. So you, you, because it's just up to a quantity, so with a probability one minus delta, you will be close uh, to, you will just have a little error term, which is in one over square root of n. And so it shows that uh, normally the deviation is small. And you can also prove this result using the doreski kiefer volvo wolfowitz inequality. So I don't know if you know about this inequality. Um, so it tells you that uh, the, the probability of the supremum between uh, the empirical cumulative density function is very close to, its, uh, to the cumulative density function. So it's very interesting because here, in fact, you have a supremum inside the probability. And so it's not a trivial result because with OFDing, in fact, you won't have been able to obtain this kind of result. So it's really difficult to have the supremum inside. And even Pascal Massard, I believe that he's working at Orsay University, showed uh, 30 years ago that you can have a sharp constant of C equals 2. And uh, so um, in this uh, second paper, we consider that we have still some heterogeneity but here it's a little bit more general because we assume that every data was following a different distribution PK. And, um, and the idea was to study if we also have some guarantee on the miscoverage rate, which is what you want to uh, study in practice, uh, because we saw that in the IID case is, uh, it's upper bounded by uh, one, by alpha plus this, uh, this term. And so we, it is in the IID case, but we wanted to study it in a more general setting. And so it was to extend uh, uh, the setting to not IID, and also to determine if the bias were more limiting that variance in, in conformal prediction. Because people generally study the bias, but I believe that the variance is more limiting. And um, so as the data have some shift, we corrected it by introducing some, uh, uh, some ratio, so it's still density ratio estimation, and we autonomize them, but this time we don't, we don't do the sum sum click trick, 
because some sampling trick is very nice if you want to have a little bias. But then, as we believe that the deviation is more limiting about the bias, we do not care about uh, tackling the bias, as at the end the deviation will be in a larger order. And so we consider uh, this uh, weighted distribution for the score function, and we also consider the prediction set for new input x, which are uh, all the labels such as uh, the score is below the quantile. And uh, the objective is, was to demonstrate that uh, with um, a high probability, we have that uh, the, um, the conditional uh, co coverage condition on the calibration data, uh, data set was very close to 1 minus alpha because we just wanted a little bit error term tau uh, of order 1 over square root of n. And the idea was really to match the IID case but this time with uh, heterogeneous data. So we make uh, several assumptions, so three of them. Uh, the first one is not uh, needed if you just want uh, uh, an upper bound, but also for to really control on uh, the left and the right, uh, the miscoverage, we did this first assumption. And the two other ones are sub-Gaussian assumptions. So it means that you will have some concentration of your uh, uh, of your uh, of your data, if you take a lot of uh, um, if you take the empirical uh, some empirical statistic, then you will have some uh, some concentration. And uh, the first result we got was that the miscoverage rate alpha of d was very close to alpha because it was uh, controlled by an error to term tau. So tau is also in one over square root of n. Because in fact, you have uh, n mi power minus 1 outside the square root, and then you have n term inside the, the square root. And we also control the bias. So it's uh, technical, so I decided not to include uh, all the proof because uh, it's quite long. And um, so the bias is also in 1 over square root of n. So we can see that it's a similar order from the deviation. And what is nice with this bond is that in some specific cases, we recover the classical weight. So for example, if CMI equals zero, it means that you have no data uh, shift. So it's, uh, you, have, you, doesn't have in, you don't have any heterogeneity. Then in fact, you recover the classical results. And, um, and just a brief uh, catch of the proof. So I won't enter into details, but the first idea was to, to study the cumulative density function. Because, in fact, uh, we know that quantile um, are very linked to con uh, cumulative density function. So, um, I don't know if you are familiar with quantile, but quantile, no, not so much. <laughs> See? Um, so, quantile, for example, if you have a quantile at, I will maybe draw um, some figures. So, for example, with the Gaussian distribution, uh, here it's the distribution, so if it is a, um, the standard one, then you here it's uh, zero, it's the mean, it's, it's, it's the deviation. And so if you look to the quantile um, zero dot uh, 90, um, so in fact you want that with probability uh, 90%, uh, the, uh, you, you are here. And with probability 10%, you are here. And so the quantile will be uh, this value, will be the quantile uh, at 90. And so, in fact, it is linked to the, sh uh, to the shape of the cumulative density function. So the cumulative density function is the probability that you are below a threshold. And um, we introduced some approximation of it. So uh, f hat, uh, which is based in our uh, way, uh, autonomized weight p, uh, pk. And in fact, uh, the first step of the proof is to show that uh, the miscoverage, if it, uh, if it is, um, no, that the, if the supremum, so the supremum error approximation is below tau, so the little error, then in fact it means that the miscoverage is uh, below alpha plus tau. And so in fact we will study this one and we will show that uh, it has a probability of at least one minus uh, delta. 
Uh, we also introduce other weights, so it's more technical. But in fact, um, as PK are autonomized, you have a ratio between some random variables and other random variables, and it's not easy to, to deal with. So we introduce some weights QK, and then we use some concentration inequality to show that QK is very close to PK. And we also introduce a G uh, at N, which is a, an empirical approximation of the cumulative density function. And in fact, it's, it is not biased, which is nice, because then, in fact, we have a very trivial equality, which is that the approximation uh, between what uh, we can compute numerically versus the true output is equal to the what we can compute minus g hat and plus a non-bias non inequality. And in fact, um, in fact, uh, we will control each term uh, separately. So the first one is due to some concentration in inequality because the weights Q, K, and P, K are very close. And the second one is, um, in fact, we propose a modification and an extension to the doresky kiefer wolfowitz inequality. So in fact, we extended the result to a more general setting. And it's why, in fact, we obtained um, our theoretical uh, result here. Uh, it was more a probabilistic paper to extend their result, and we find also some application in uncertainty uh, management. So uh, the main idea, uh, so here it's a kind of Markov uh, inequality. So we show that the supremum of this approximation uh, error uh, being be, uh, above tau is uh, be controlled by this quantity. So here it's the cosinus hyperbolic. And you can then uh, optimize in theta at the end. Oops, sorry. Yes. Um, so um, if you use cosinus hyperbolic of x being below exponential of x squared divided by 2, with some uniform weight, then you obtain the famous DKW theorem. But if you use some sharper inequality, and then, in fact, you can show that uh, you, you can derive better results. And uh, we did that, and we obtained this final bound. And so we know that we can control this, uh, this term by this one. And then we just invert it to, to put it as delta. So we find tau such that this exponential is equal to, to delta. <coughs> and so and just to recap, so we studied this miscoverage rate, which is personalized to client G. We showed that the bias is of order square root of log n divided by n. And also with huge probability, you have that uh, the, the deviation between the miscoverage and the targeted level alpha can be controlled by something that is proportional to 1 over square root of n. So if you f choose delta as n, in fact, you can see that the bias is of the same order than the deviation. So for numerical application, uh, it's maybe better to look at the algorithm that would have small deviation rather than just small bias. And um, we also effectuated some experiments that are close to the previous paper. Just this time, we look at covariate shift. So it assumes that the uh, distribution of x change between clients. So for example, you can have application in speech recognition, because in speech recognition, if you have training, uh, you have training data from English speakers, and then you go through French speakers, then in fact, the action, accent will be a little bit different. So it can have some applications. And uh, here, we obtain some uh, numerical results. So it is not surprising, because the global method is still, which is in um, um, orange, is undercovering if you have uh, a big shift. So um, the shift is going there. And here is the coverage in function of the shift. And so at the beginning, uh, the global method is rather good. But at the end, the more you have shift, the more it will deviate. Uh, the local method is in uh, green. So we can see that the bias is very small. In fact, the bias is even smaller than our uh, method. But as the deviation is uh, 
uh, smaller for our method. In fact, I believe that it's better to communicate with other to train better uh, model. So to conclude uh, this part and also the presentation, um, so uh, uh, we we introduce some algorithm to handle um, uncertainty and to quantify it. Uh, it was um, it was with conformal methods, so I believe that they are very strong for that and very useful, even if there are alternatives with Bayesian method and also other methods, but I believe that conformal is very nice for that. Uh, there is also a rich literature on that. Uh, Sylvain Allo, who is also a teacher at Orsay, sub uh, submitted some paper in this field. So his idea was a little bit different. He was studying quantile of quantile, so his client were transmitting quantile to the central server, which uh, who was aggregating it, and also computing quantile. There are also papers from Michael Jordan and other famous people. And I believe that just a few perspectives of future research will be also to study as a conditional coverage, but condition on X. So it's more natural because X can be an individual. So it's very nice if you have some heteroselasticity in your data, meaning that the distribution will change a lot for some individuals. And it could have great application in medicine, for example, if you are doctors and you want to be sure about some treatment. Then, in fact, you want to personalize your treatment uh, to someone who is 67 and has some disease. And is why it's important to, to build some methods uh, condition on X, even if there are a lot of results and also negative results in this field. Uh, I believe that it could have great applications. So that's all for my uh, talk. Thank you very much. Yes, a question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, about the ImageNet experiments, how did you model the shift in practice, the level of shift? Uh, um, in fact, we split randomly uh, the data to several users. And uh, in practice, uh, for example, in the first in these experiments, uh, what we did is that we said, oh, for example, we will put every dog in for these users. We will put more cat or house for this one. And then, in fact, they will generate prediction set, but which are very specified to what they received. So for example, client one will be very good for some, uh, for some task. But then, if you look to client two, in fact, uh, um, it, w it won't have the same data distribution. And so you want to benefit from, uh, for example, the one that saw more house or more horses and um, I believe that it can have application in medicine because, for example, uh, some hospitals uh, see certain, ki uh, certain kind of patients, uh, for example, that are older or, some, or have some uh, particular uh, disease. And so you would like to make them communicate. It's very difficult because there are a lot of regulation on that. Uh, but I believe that it could have some application for that and also for autonomous driving cars. And even, for example, I believe that your uh, uh, your key, uh, your old text auto completion algorithm uh, is using this kind of algorithm because, in fact, when you tape uh, your name, uh, it will guess where you live, it will guess your family name, and because there was some personalization. And did you study regression as well or only classification? Uh, so s here it was more classification. Um, we just did classification on vision, but it's true that regression is also very important. Um, I did it, but in other paper, not in this one. Um, in uh, conformal prediction, you're mainly focusing on like obtaining the exact uh, coverage, mm -hmm. but are there some work where like you try to conditioning on like the fact that you have the exact coverage minimize the size of the prediction sets or some stuff? Yes. Uh, um, I believe that having a certain threshold is very important, but given generally people can create algorithms that will satisfy for this threshold and then they will try to minimize the, the size of the prediction set. They won't 
uh, they uh, they won't destroy the confidence level for the size because in fact um, if you take an empty set it will work so for example the trivial things not to do is to create this prediction set which will be uh, empty set or uh, everything so omega uh, here it will be alpha percent of the time uh, and I mean 100 alpha percent times alpha and here uh, to be uh, to to be this uh, no sorry uh, alpha yes alpha and with probability uh, one minus alpha here in fact you have the good coverage so you have that uh, y will belong to this one but is not very convincing because then you don't have a lot of information so you won't sacrifice the targeted level. Uh, but there are some ideas to try to, to reduce it uh, because, as we mentioned, in fact, if you have a very easy task, for example, to classify some digits, it's very simple, you have very uh, sharp uh, prediction on that, then, in fact, you want very small prediction set uh, um, often. But then, in some field, for example, you will prefer to, to be very sure not to miss people, for example, that have certain disease, and you will like to have use prediction, prediction set, you prefer to have to be sure not to miss something. And you prefer sometimes to um, false, so, so it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the rate of true of uh, false, uh, I don't, I don't um, to be sure not to miss someone. But uh, maybe may yeah. just on this, um, so I understand this uh, image net uh, use case is a classification problem, right? If I understand correctly, so basically you construct a, uh, you call it the, like a conformal set or something, so it's kind of like a confidence interval, right, with a confidence level. So how do you move from this result to you label it? Uh, um, I'm not sure to fully understand, so we use a pre-trained model. So it was easy to find on uh, several library, for example, for PyTorch will give pre-trained model with very nice performance. And then we construct our uh, conformity score from that. In fact, it's a conformity score that is uh, based on the training data set and so that we'll use the pre-trained model. And, um, and for that, and then after we compute the conformity scores on every client. So for example, if we have uh, uh, n client, then here we have a data set d1, dn. Here we will compute every score function for any data on client one. And then we will compute the weight that we described earlier. And in fact, we will, uh, we'll try to, to learn the quantile in a federated way that pre preserve privacy. And, um, and then once we have the good quantile, we then we can send it back to, to the client and they will be able to create sharper prediction set. But was it your question or not? I'm not sure. Uh, so, but for this uh, score V, so does it depends on a specific uh, set or not? Uh, v here, it just, um, so, so it just maps the data to the real line and it depends, it does, um, it depends on the uh, pre-trained model. So in fact, the pre-trained model depends on the set so, for example, if you want to switch to CIFAR 10 or other vision data set, then you are to, to switch your pre-trained model, and so you will change your conformity score. So then the idea is actually you try to correct the uh, label shifting from the different client. Right? Yes, yes. Here, in fact, we use something very, very naive, because we just count the number of label on each client. So it's very the, the zero method. We just, uh, for example, if someone has 10 data and he has uh, five dogs, then we will, uh, uh, we will assume that his distribution is just, uh, uh, there is a probability one over two because it's f five over uh, 10 uh, for dogs. Uh, uh, sorry, but sorry to interrupt, but just to yes. understand more precisely. So the way you try to correct this is you try to construct kind of a generic model and then apply to different uh, uh, client. Um, no. Um, ah, yes, yes, um, yes. You are right. You are right. Yeah. 
Uh, here it's the weight. The aggregated one, right? Uh, but then my question is, so if we kind of uh, assume that each client has a different uh, distribution, uh, isn't that more uh, reasonable to try a dedicated model per client rather than using a uh, um, single model for all the clients? I, I am not so sure. I mean that in some point you are, re uh, you are right because in federated learning, there are some kind of personalization. So you are maybe right. We should have maybe uh, pick a conformity scores according to uh, the specific pre-trained model. But in personalized uh, federated learning, generally you have some part of the weight that are the same for everyone. And just, for example, the last layer that will be more personalized. And so as uh, a structure of the conformity score should be sim the same for everyone, but maybe we can add a little bit more uh, 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 personalized. Uh. Okay. And here, in fact, the weights are different for every client because there are some G. In fact, the ratio <laughs> depends on the G GF client. So it will change uh, according to whom you want to create prediction set. And, and for the second uh, experiment, we also did, uh, for the second article, experiment on ImageNet, but with a covariate, uh, co uh, covariate shift. So this time it was the distribution of X were uh, changing. So it was the speech, speech, speech recognition um, uh, ID um, uh, setting, because in fact, if you have some uh, people that have different accents, then in fact, uh, according to the accent, the distribution of X will change was the label which has uh, the word that you pronounce, the word that you have given what you pronounce. This one will be the same because the word won't change even if you have different pronunciation. And here's the pronunciation. And so we did some experiments with this kind of idea. And uh, we did uh, also crude estimate of uh, the density uh, ratio estimate because we use a Gaussian mixture models. So it is very crude but it gives us good result. So we believe that you have to, to take into, into account the shift, even if it is with bad model, it's even better that not to take into account it. So you mentioned the privacy of uh, this federated mm. learning thing, but if I'm not... Uh, Wrong. You haven't talked about the yes, privacy, I, I, did you? Yes. So, uh, you consider this uh, epsilon delta difference? Yeah, yes, it's what we did. In fact, we show some differential privacy uh, theory on that. But in fact, it's why I don't like in my presentation is that I have several results that I don't mention. And it's a little bit, I wanted to, to maybe describe the conformal uh, field. And so I, I miss a lot of parts. But uh, in fact, it's easy to ensure differential privacy. It's natural. I mean, it's not easy, but it's natural uh, because you have some pinball loss function. And what you look at uh, to, to be private means that for, uh, as you transfer some gradient generally, in fact, if you have a bounded gradient, it's perfect. And here, in fact, if you look to our pinball loss function, everything has, uh, uh, is almost bounded. If you look to the in fact, to the gradient of this, this loss function, it is bounded because it's a kind of absolute value. So the derivative will be an indicator. And so it's, uh, it's naturally bounded. And so it's natural to have differential uh, privacy theory for that. The, the rate with which epsilon goes into the, this estimation of alpha, is it optimal or uh, do you have some gap over there? Because I imagine the uh, variance should increase uh, with the uh, uh, with the epsilon being uh, small, I guess. Yes. 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 So. Um, uh, to, I I don't remember exactly what we got, but in fact it was nice because uh, the bound were e explicit, so we had every constant of the problem. For example, the number of users. Uh, because then in function of your numbers of users, you have to, s to, to noise uh, what you send to the central server to keep privacy. And we had everything explicit, but I don't remember the bound. It was two years ago, but... Uh, 
But in fact, here we lost a little bit because we want smooth function. As um, I mentioned, in fact, in federated learning, to have convergence property, you have to, to have smooth uh, loss function. And in fact, if you regularize with a Moro, so Moro, Moro envelope, ah, j'aurais pas dû le toucher, <laughs> désolé. Uh, then, in fact, you have one over gamma a smoothness. And so, in your bond, you will lose because you will have one over n times gamma, and as gamma is maybe a, a small, in fact, you lost a little bit by regularizing, but uh, you are sure to converge. So, there are some trade-offs, and it's the same with privacy. You, you know. Est-ce que vous avez encore des questions? questions we can take a coffee break and then we'll start again at 11 30 with the veronica Fantini as our next speaker thank you thank you very much mm -hmm. <laughs>